My name is Lakana. I'm a doctoral researcher at LMU. I've been following US politics on and off um, for most of the 21st century. Um, in particular, I followed the uh, last US presidential election from early 2015 until November 2016. So uh, why is this topic relevant to the general public? Uh, the US is still the uh, biggest economic and military power in the world, and the actions of its president uh, have um, global ramifications. Um, Trump is a deeply polarizing figure, both within the US and internationally. He is um, very popular in some countries, such as Israel. He's um, deeply unpopular in some countries, such as Mexico. <laughs> yeah. uh, Trump's victory was a seismic shock to the global political order. Um, it was shocking to both his supporters and his opponents because um, the majority um, certainly most of the opinion polls predicted a Hillary Clinton presidency. Yeah, so uh, this is an actual magazine cover from Newsweek. They uh, printed this before the election results were known. And um, after the election results became apparent, they um, pulled, uh, they had to withdraw thousands of magazines from circulation. Um, so let's look at some predictions. According to the New York Times, Hillary Clinton had an 85% chance of winning. Uh, 538, so uh, 538 is a website run by a guy called Nate Silver. He is a statistician and a journalist. He predicted Hillary had a 71.4% percent chance of winning. Uh, this is what actually happened. Trump um, won comfortably. Um, as you can see, he won the South, most of the Midwest, and most of the Great Lakes area. I'll first talk about the US electoral college system, and then I'll talk about factors that contributed to Trump's success. First, I'll address the US electoral college system. The uh, US has a presidential system, unlike the parliamentary system they have here in Germany. So the people elect a president directly. In um, countries which have a presidential system, such as France, they have two or more candidates. Uh, people vote for these two candidates. Um, and uh, the person who gets the most votes becomes the president. This is not how it works in the US. <laughs> the, um, so um, this is the US electoral college. And um, first of all, the term electoral college is a misnomer. Um, it doesn't refer to any actual college. It's actually a process. So first of all, what do these numbers st stand for? Each number is the number of members of Congress from each state. And how do you com come up with these numbers? These um, numbers are roughly based on population. And the most important thing about the Electoral College is even if you win a state by the slightest margin, you will win all the electoral votes for that state. You have a couple of exceptions like um, Nebraska and uh, Maine up here, but in 48 out of 50 states, if you um, basically win the um, majority of the votes for that state, you win all the electoral votes for that state. So if you add up all the numbers you see up here, it comes to 538, and you need 270 to win. In the US, you have two major political parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. The Republican Party is represented on the right by the elephant symbol, and the Democrats are represented by the donkey. The, the, 
Um, on political maps, the Republicans are shown by the color red and the Democrats are shown by the color blue. So they have um, blue states in the US which are heavily Democrat and Republicans have no chance of winning these states. So as you can see, the West Coast and most of the Northeast are heavily Democrat. The biggest blue state is California, which has 55 electoral votes. There are red states which are heavily Republican and the Democrats have no chance of winning these states. As you can see, the South and most of the Midwest are heavily re Republican. The biggest red state is Texas with 38 electoral votes. Then you have um, swing states which are also known as purple states or battleground states. Um, so the biggest purple state is Florida with 29 electoral votes. These states have roughly equal numbers of Republicans and Democrats. So they could go either way. So politicians spend most of their time, money and resources campaigning in these states because uh, they could uh, easily go either way. So one key factor about the electoral college is even if you win by the tiniest margins, you will win all the electoral votes for that state. So let's look at two states won by Hillary and two states won by Trump. So uh, if you look at the states of Michigan and Pennsylvania, which were won by Trump, he won them by 0.23% and 0.72% respectively, and he won all the electoral votes for those two states. Um, with New Hampshire and Minnesota, Hil Hillary won them by 0.37% and 1.52% respectively, and she won all the electoral votes for those two states. I'll now look at factors that contributed to Trump's success. S to win the presidency, you have to win most of these uh, purple states. And um, Trump had two parts uh, to win the presidency. He could either concentrate on winning the states of Nevada, Colorado, and New Mexico, which um, these states uh, used to be swing states, but in recent years they've become increasingly Democrat leaning because the Hispanic population in these states have been increasing. And Trump's tough rhetoric on building a border wall and deporting illegal, immigra uh, in, in, uh, deporting illegal immigrants um, wasn't looked at that favorably by Hispanic immigrants. So it would be really tough for him to win those states. So he then uh, concentrated on winning the Rust Belt and by the Rust Belt, I mean the states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. And the Rust Belt used to be the economic heartland of the US. There used to be um, a lot of factories, coal mines, steelworks, but in the past few decades, the Rust Belt had, had been steadily losing manufacturing jobs. So Trump um, came to the Rust Belt and he promised to bring back jobs to the Rust Belt. He blamed both legal and illegal immigration for the steady er erosion of jobs. He um, promised to end illegal immigration and restrict legal immigration. He also promised to get rid of unfair trade deals such as NAFTA. NAFTA stands for North American Free Trade Agreement. And uh, he also promised to get rid of um, environmental regulations which would um, restrict, according to him, economic growth. So why were the predictions wrong? The opinion polls underestimated um, support for Trump. They also heavily overestimated democratic turnout. They thought uh, democratic turnout in 2016 was going to be the same as 2012. Um, African American turnout in particular was much lower than four years ago because um, most African American voters were reluctant to vote for Hillary Clinton. And uh, meanwhile, um, some 
there was certainly a lot of hidden support for Trump as well, especially amongst women. So um, it um, seemed like Trump didn't have much female support, but uh, in the end he um, got a significant am amount of female support. So he won 43% of the female vote and 53% of the white female vote. Trump had a lot of name recognition because he used to uh, run a uh, TV show called, uh, he used to host a TV show called The Apprentice for seven years. He also hosted seven years of Celebrity Apprentice. So he capitalized on his name recognition. He would uh, phone in to a, a morning show like Fox and Friends and uh, he would uh, speak for five minutes and get uh, nationwide coverage at virtually no cost. And uh, meanwhile, most of his presidential opponents, uh, with the exception of Hillary Clinton, uh, they didn't have name recognition. Uh, most people had no idea who these people were, what their policies were. And this was because the media was ob obsessed with covering Trump. Um, and uh, Twitter is a uh, medium which uh, perfectly suited Trump. Trump was actually uh, quite skillful in using social media, especially Twitter. It uh, suited his rhetorical style because he could send a short message. It, uh, he could reach directly to his supporters without going through the media because if he tried to go through the media, they would try to filter his message. So his message, um, he could directly deliver a short, sharp message to his supporters or anyone who was on his, uh, who, yeah, following him on Twitter. And uh, what he would do is uh, he would send a controversial tweet and CNN and MSNBC, they would pick up on this tweet, they would be, uh, he would usually tweet something controversial, so they would be appalled and outraged, they would hold a six or eight person panel and they would discuss this issue intensely for the whole day. And then, uh, so Trump could dominate any political um, cycle he wanted to. So if he wanted to change the topic, a couple of days later, he'll send another tweet. And then the anchors at CNN and MSNBC, they would be predictably outraged. They will hold another six or eight person panel. They'll talk, they'll discuss the issue intensely. And what this meant was, with the exception of Hillary Clinton, most of his political opponents didn't get any media coverage. Voters didn't know who these people were, what they stood for, what their policies were. And uh, Hillary Clinton was partially able to overcome this problem because um, she had twice as much campaign funds as Trump, so she could afford to run these expensive TV ads. But with the other presidential candidates, they didn't have that kind of money, so they simply didn't. Uh, they simply weren't able to get their message across. In conclusion, um, Trump recognized that the working class people, especially in the Rust Belt, felt aggrieved. He promised to bring jobs back uh, that have been lost over the past few decades, and um, he promised to stop illegal immigration and restrict legal immigration. There is a military, code, uh, a military quote that um, generals have a tendency to fight the last war. Uh, in the context of the 2016 presidential election, what that means is, the, um, according to conventional wisdom, politicians are supposed to spend a lot of money on TV, print, and radio ads, and Trump proved you don't necessarily have to do that. If you say something controversial, the media will pick up on it. They'll give you a lot of coverage. And by skillfully using Twitter, he could reach uh, his supporters directly without going through the media. I'm uh, happy to take any questions you have. Um, there's no such thing as a silly question. Even if you have something really simple, I'm happy to answer it. <laughs> So we have some time for questions. I'm highly polarizing figure here, probably. <laughs> Please. Hi, 
Uh, well, during his campaign, now President Trump went um, on the platform Make America Great Again and America First. And last year, during the Munich Security Conference, uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Sege Lavrov called for a call to the West world. And we've been seeing China increasingly um, taking uh, every chance to show that they're better taking every advantage that is possible. So, do you think? In 2020 or post 2020, this damage of isolationism, protectionism, can somehow be controlled, or will we be facing a completely Chinese overtaken world, an East world rather than West world? <laughs> <laughs> this is one hell of a question, actually. So it's more about uh, what's your prediction uh, 2020 and what's about international politics with china and this rhetoric of make america great again probably right so, sure. <laughs> so uh, china will overtake the u.s as the biggest economy sometime in the next 20 or 30 years so that's inevitable regarding military power uh, the u.s will remain the predominant military power for at least another 50 years. Um, regarding isolationism, um, Trump wants to win the next election, so he has to win the Rust Belt again. So by putting tariff barriers, for example, it will help the Rust Belt, and uh, it will help the steelworks, the coal miners, uh, for example, and it'll, bring, it'll increase manufacturing jobs in the Rust Belt. So he's only thinking about the next four years. Um, he's not thinking that long term, so um, yeah, I think he has a very high chance of winning the Rust Belt yeah. again. Mm, we have time for questions, uh, please. You see that uh, Trump had a lot of coverage uh, because he was tweeting controversial stuff, so he would have a lot of coverage. I don't know for Germany, but I expect the same. In France, there is a rush of coverage, so the media cannot just talk about a single candidate. So whatever bullshit uh, or controversy <laughs> Trump will uh, spread on Twitter, they will have to spend the equivalent time on the other candidates. So did this happen? Is there this rule actually? Uh, so the question essentially about the rules of uh, amount of media coverage per candidate and if it can be extended to Twitter. So uh, tr it's estimated that Trump had five, uh, he got five billion dollars of free advertising for the um, during the presidential campaign. That's more than all the other presidential candidates combined. In the US there was, uh, there is no rule, there is no rule on giving equal media time for presidential candidates. Um, I think I forgot to mention this uh, during my presentation, but um, the, uh, so yeah, there is no, um, yeah, um, there's no rule about giving candidates equal time. At one stage, the media, they were so obsessed with um, covering Trump that um, they would cover an empty podium like this for one hour before he spoke. So uh, they were anticipating, um, they were just uh, waiting for him to come and speak and they didn't want to miss a second of his speech because he was usually going to say something controversial. So they would film a podium, an empty podium like this for one hour and all the major channels gave uh, uh, covered just like this, uh, and um, even channels that did that uh, dislike Trump, like CNN, MSNBC, they did the same thing, and the result was the minor candidates they got no media coverage, and they were not able to get their points across. We have time for one more question, so uh, please. So do you think you will be voted in again with you know with all the um, position rising? So the the question is, what's the prediction for 2020 for him to win again? Um, the, uh, so I'm happy to have a very detailed conversation. I can give you a very detailed breakdown of that uh, during the break or at the end. Um, so due to lack of time, I'll give you a very quick answer, which is yes, um, I believe he has a very high chance of winning the presidency in 2020. The short answer is that um, he will be financially so much better off uh, than he was last time. So he, um, as the incumbent president, he's not running against a primary candidate so he can save that money. Meanwhile, um, so during the last election, all the banks gave money to um, Hillary, especially Goldman Sachs. Now there are four Goldman Sachs executives working in the Trump administration. All the, I mean, most of the money from the banks will go to Trump. 
The another reason is Hillary Clinton is um, the strongest candidate he could have faced. She will not be r running next time. Uh, Bernie Sanders will be 79 uh, um, w in uh, 2020. There could be some Democratic candidate who is probably capable of taking him on, but um, at the moment um, they don't have much uh, national name recognition. So thank you, Lakana.